Um, why consider CO2 angiography in the first place? Well, you want to avoid contrast-induced nephropathy. And it's important to understand the definition of this. It's a rise in serum creatinine of 0.5 milligrams per deciliter or a rise of serum creatinine greater than 25% of baseline uh, to avoid severe allergic response in patients who have true anaphylaxis to contrast media. It is a lower viscosity agent. Therefore, we can image via very small bore, very long catheters. You can image when you have very close tolerances, six French devices, for instance, and six French sheaths. And it occasionally allows visualization of critically stenotic graphs that appear totally occluded by iodinated contrast. And finally, it's cheaper. The cost of CO2 is about two cents a cc versus a dollar a cc for most of the iodinated contrasts. But the big reason for cost are indirect costs. We have longer hospital stays, medications, and certainly, if dialysis is required, tremendously increased costs. In fact, just contrast-induced nephropathy with a minor bump in creatinine is associated with greater than $10,000 of extra cost per patient. So we really want to avoid this if possible. Now, why is this so important in today's world? Well, diabetes is epidemic worldwide. More interventions are being performed, and we're performing more difficult interventions, and we're performing them in older patients. And certainly, all of these have risk of contrast-induced nephropathy. And many of you may say, well, how about the renal failure patient? If he's already on dialysis, does it matter? The answer is yes. If you take a patient on dialysis who is making urine, and that patient becomes anuric, you've hurt that patient. So why CO2 specifically? Well, it's been studied extensively in angiography. It's produced endogenously, therefore we can't really have allergic response, and uh, there is no risk of contrast-induced nephropathy. Now, uh, gases have been utilized in imaging all the way back to when Conrad Rentgen discovered the X-ray, and he realized there were different tissues, including different densities, including air density. Rotenberg in 1914 placed air in the abdominal uh, cavity to visualize viscera. And you can see others used different forms of air. But CO2 was ultimately uh, the, the gas used when we wanted to have a gas uh, density because, it, because of its solubility. And in 1971 is really when CO2 angiography really gained any popularity purely by accident. Dr. Hawkins had placed a pigtail catheter in an abdominal aorta, inadvertently injected air, and he visualized the celiac axis. Patient got very sick, but he realized he could see the vessels and perhaps CO2 would work. So understand how this works. X-ray travels more easily through gas, therefore the image is an exact negative of that created by iodinated contrast, which actually block um, uh, x-ray. And there's less contrast than with iodinated contrast, therefore motion severely impairs image. Overlying bile gas may be problematic. Now, the characteristics of CO2 you must understand. It's non-toxic, it's non-flammable, it's buoyant, it's compressible, it has ultra-low viscosity, and it's highly soluble, far more soluble than oxygen, which is infinitely more soluble than nitrogen. It doesn't mix with blood, you must displace blood. It floats anterior if allowed to simply sit because it wants to float. You have to displace blood and enlarge abdominal aortic aneurysms when large amounts of CO2 are given, you can actually have trapping and that can result in ischemia. The best way to do this is not give such big volumes, but you can, if that happens, you can consider aspiration, or you can rotate the patient and simply move it away from the gut vessels. What about toxicity? Well, no one was able to show with angiography toxicity. A single dose of 1.6 cc's per kilogram showed no hemodynamic effects, and CO2 is totally cleared from the body within 30 to 60 seconds. So there was no dose limitation of CO2, including in patients who have CO2 retention. Optimizing CO2 images is crucial. It requires DSA imaging 
and it's crucial the patient not move. It's ideal to use end hold catheters rather than side hold catheters because they cause less bubbles. And you want to place the catheter as close to the artery to be imaged as possible. You want to do a slow, low pressure injection. You're doing these by hand because it doesn't require nearly as much pressure to inject as iodinated contrast. You want to rotate the patient or the camera if there's excessive bowel gas, and you can consider glucagon to get rid of that gas. And you must realize that gravity affects imaging. I use this often in my CLI patients, but when I do, I elevate the leg. I put it on pillows. That allows the gas to flow, uh, to float. Now, in some cases, you just can't see perfectly with CO2 alone. But what Seeger showed was CO2 was pretty good when used alone, 92% uh, correlation with contrast. But if you use CO2 and you supplemented it with six to 10 cc's of contrast in his series, it had 100% correlation. So in many cases, we only use CO2, but there are some cases we use CO2 as a guide and we may give very small amounts of iodinated contrast. So the positives, no renal toxicity, no dose limitations. You can image via small aboric long catheters, less cost, but there's some negatives. There's more radiation. Your imagery, imaging systems must have CO2 settings. Most systems in today's world don't allow road mapping. Motion artifact dramatically limits imaging. Overlying gas may be problematic. It may be suboptimal in very large vessels, albeit the vena cava has been visualized fairly well. You can image, uh, the image quality is slightly less crisp than iodinated contrast, and you cannot use this in cerebral or coronary vessels. Now, initially this was done using industrial CO2, and when Hawkins started to use these, he decided he would look inside these CO2 tanks rolled into the uh, cath lab, and he found carbonic acid, particulate matter, including rust, water, and so he really advocated a closed system. This is a system I presently use, but there are other systems. But what I like about this system, and you see its size compared to a 30cc syringe, this whole system weighs under a pound, and you can place it on the patient field, and it's a no-brainer setup. You can set this up in a matter of half a minute. So some cases, here you see uh, just feeling of abdominal aorta. You can indeed see it by injecting. This is a patient that we're imaging. The we, uh, patient had bilateral uh, claudication. Patient's going to have a common femoral lesion, which we see with oblique views. We ultimately treat this with balloon and for some reason this is not playing, but let's try that. And here's the final still image with CO2. Case two, this is a patient who has just a simple lesion in the superficial femoral artery, had a creatinine, however, of 4.5. Very simple case. You can stent and see what we're doing. Very interesting case here, very dense calcium. You'd say certainly you can't see anything. A true critical ischemic patient, creatinine of five, still making urine. So in this case, we're going to take images. The proximal SFA looks okay. We'll come down and we're going to see the next part of the vessel doesn't look so good. We can see a high-grade lesion here, but we're gonna blow this up in just a second to see with a little better clarity. And here's going to be the distal vessel. Flow is coming down here very slowly. In just a second, you'll see why. So this is a blown up view. There's a total occlusion here. We're able to slowly get through this dense calcium. We ballooned, we stent. We did this entire case in this man with this very elevated creatinine with no contrast whatsoever. So CO2 angiography has really changed my practice. I no longer pre-admit patients for renal insufficiency to hydrate them or keep them after the procedure simply because of hydration. We don't need pre-medication for allergies if we're planning to use just this. Many of these patients who've had major contrast uh, allergic responses have great anxiety about having iodinated contrast. This allows you to get by without that. And frankly, it's dramatically decreased the number of patients on whom I wouldn't consider intervention even an option in the past.
So I think this is a therapy you should all learn about. Thank you.